Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, five drill musicians have been banned from writing lyrics encouraging violence and ordered to warn police before they record or perform any songs. In the first judgment of its kind, the judge imposed a three-year criminal behaviour order on the gang members who are serving sentences for conspiracy to commit violent disorder. All of them are part of the, of the 1011, or is it 1011 drill group? I'm not sure. Which has racked up millions of views on YouTube. And a warning, there is flash photography in Camion Zone's report from the start. I'm still out here trying to eat a meal. I spent whole nights lurking in the field. UK drill is at the creative front line of British urban music. It's young and it's brash. Some of its leading artists and many of its fans are still only in their teens. Real is 21st century urban commentators of the day. The sound of the streets, as it were. It's the new sound through which young people can express themselves. But there's no denying its provocative imagery. A frequent and very un-British use of the N-word. Try me, I wish it and a nihilistic fetishization of violence, the kind of not-so-trivial postcode rivalries that have cost the lives of dozens of young black men already this year. Today, a judge banned five young drill artists from performing or uploading songs that incite violence. They call themselves 1011 after their West London postcode. The ruling is significant, thought to be the first time a CBO, a modern-day ASBO, has been used to censor art. As ever, the detail is as important as the context. One November night last year, the men were arrested carrying weapons. They initially claimed that the weapons were just props for, guess what, a music video. But the court heard they were, in fact, plotting revenge against a rival group who'd threatened one of their grandmothers but they eventually pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit violent disorder. Look at the weapons found in their possession and consider the hyper-local tit-for-tat beefs glorified in their lyrics, like No Hook, a song that makes repeated references to stabbing. So, is this just fantasy? Or do violent songs encourage violent acts? There is a clear link between these drill videos, as they're called, and the violence that would certainly have occurred the day when our officers intercepted these five young men on their way to undoubtedly commit an act of very serious violence. But even for police, censorship is murky water. Clearly, there are more people getting murdered. We've got to understand what's causing it. If it's videos, then let's see what we can do about it. I'm not convinced yet. Drill videos are a glimpse down impoverished streets Middle England doesn't see and doesn't understand. Drill is very much a cry for help. Even though they sound sinister, they're really saying, come to my neighbourhood, see what's going on. I don't know if the police and the state have done enough to really engage with young people in a way that they understand where they're coming from and giving them what they need to make sure that these problems don't happen. Drill as a genre began in America and has since been embraced and reinterpreted by London. When I think about my bros, who, yes, rap about violence, but there is more to it, as it matures into increasingly sophisticated productions that suggest horizons that stretch way beyond the estates of Peckham. Well, I'm joined now by Patrick Green from the Ben Kinsella Trust and Melody Simpson, a criminal barrister who has represented a member of the 1011 drill group in the court hearing, and I'm glad we've established it's 1011. Um, the police say we're not trying to kill music or kill anyone's enjoyment. This is just common sense. They're trying to stop murder. Well, so far as the drill music is concerned, I think it's too simplistic to say that it's the music that is fueling the crime and the violence in London at the moment. Um, there is a problem with particular lyrics, and it's important that lyrics don't cross the line. So if there are lyrics that are, insulted, that are, that are inciting or encouraging, 
um, violence towards a particular gang or particular group or particular individual, then there are ways to deal with that within the law. Yeah, but after the event's too late, isn't it? Someone could be killed by that. Well, the thing about the music is that it's also a social commentary. You know, it's not every single video that is, that is, that is called Drill um, that is inciting violence. A lot of these young people are disenfranchised and they are rapping about what they see, not necessarily what they are going to do or what they intend to do. So it's too simplistic to say that because of this genre of music um, that there is a rise in knife and gang crime. I completely accept that there are some videos and there are some lyrics where gangs are rapping back and forth about what they're going to do to each other and sometimes yeah. it's a problem. And that's what this is. Yeah. This was a problem. But, but on the whole, yeah. to say that the whole genre of drill music is a problem, it, 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 in, in my view, is just Patrick, too simplistic. Yeah. Patrick Green, I mean, yeah, this does raise all sorts of alarm bells, doesn't it, about censorship and freedom yeah. of expression? Yeah, um, and I think this just shows in terms of law enforcement, I mean, it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing that law enforcement could do. Um, if you've got uh, two groups of young people, one group inciting violence against one another, you have to seek a legal remedy. However, this doesn't solve the problem. What we know from youth culture is uh, you ban something, you, in you inevitably make it more popular. Um, you know, if you wanted to get a hit record many years ago, have it banned and it would go straight to number one. What we've got to do more of is not just ban the music, but, but help young people educate young people away from inciting violence against one another. But if you're saying banning is a bad idea because it makes things no, more popular, then no, why it, is this the right thing to do? It's, I'm not saying banning is the, is the, right, is the wrong thing. The, what we should be doing is educating and helping people cre create more positive forms of art that re recognise their social situation, uh, the deprivation, the world that they live in, but it shouldn't be about destroying one another. And this is what this is. This is about one group of young people going out to murder another group of young people. If this was hate crime, if, this, if, if these young people were, were targeting somebody else because of the colour of their skin, because of their religion, we would have no problem with, with, with this. Can I, can no I just say that so far as this case is concerned, this offence did not arise out of a particular music video. It arose out of a video where it was a taunting and someone's grandmother became involved. So it wasn't a particular, it wasn't a particular music video that the 1011 had put out that caused this crime. But what happened afterwards was that obviously they were arrested because of this video and the police... Um, introduced um, a number of their previous music videos um, wh which had some pretty pretty bad lyrics in them um, and they used them as bad character and then um, have used them to, um, to, to, to get a criminal behaviour. Are, are you saying any kind of preemptive banning is a bad idea? Um, well look I'm not saying that. Of course, I'm not saying that. So there it, are circumstances there under are, which you think there, there it would are, be a good idea. There to do are this. circumstances in which, for example, you've got one gang that is, for example, rapping about what they're going to do to another gang, um, and there is a, the other gang is rapping about what they're going to what they're going to do back, um, and there is a problem in the community between these two gangs. So it could. Um, end up in real world violence. We're not just talking about online people just, you know, saying um, things mm. that they don't mean. If it, if it could result in real world violence, then of course that's a problem and of course it needs to be dealt with. But what we also need to consider is that the police do have other powers. That, that is the point, isn't it, Patrick Green? I mean, there are other things they could do. They could have intelligence-led policing that stops this. Yeah, but uh, when, when it gets to, to this level, I, I, I think law enforcement has, has little option. Absolutely, we, we should be addressing this far earlier. When this gets to the courts, it's gone too far. Um, we should be working with, with, with young people, and if the police need to, to, to invoke powers earlier, do that. Um, but, you know, when, when it gets to the courts, it's, it's, it, it's, it's too late. If a crime is being committed, then of course they should deal with that. But the, what's, what's happened in this case is that it's been dealt with, in a sense, by a criminal behaviour order and a criminal behaviour order which is actually quite far-reaching. And what it means is that, so far as this group are concerned, they will have to give the police um, notice yeah. and mm. get authorisation before they record or perform I'm afraid music. we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you yeah. both very much thank indeed very for much. coming in. Cathy. Thanks, Chris.
Two teenagers have been jailed for more than 20 years each after stabbing a charity worker to death during a violent robbery spree in West London. Nathan Gilmaney, now 19, and Troy Thomas, 18, injured four others as they rode around on a moped, stuffing their pockets with valuables. The judge described CCTV footage of their crimes as chilling. Simeon Brown was at the Old Bailey. It's seven minutes past 12 on this quiet October night in West London, and this man notices something is not quite right. He's being followed, and continues at the same pace until he takes off. The men chasing are barely men at all. They are teenagers. They appear to have him cornered. He gives up his bag and manages to escape. But his ordeal is far from over. The chase continues for almost 10 minutes. The man running for his life does not know the attackers. This could be any of us and it was just one of a string of robberies the two teenagers carried out that night, armed with knives. The victim here escaped with his life by giving up his possessions, but moments earlier, 28-year-old Abdul Samad was not so fortunate. The two masked teenagers stabbed a charity worker in the chest, trying to get the pin for his phone. He died on his doorstep. There had been so many offences that night that the police were aware that there was a moped out there committing numerous offences. They were actively looking for a moped. Um, one, of the, one of our ARV cars, that's our armed cars, came across this moped that immediately made off from, from them. It's a black moped, no VRM. They went down the dead alley, there's a foot chase. And it's a decom, decom. Armed police! Stay where you are! Armed police! During the chase, the younger suspect, then 17, tries to hide underneath a parked car. The vehicle you're off on your right-hand side now is underneath that vehicle. The heat detectors on the helicopter made him a sitting duck. These are the attackers without their masks. Today, 19-year-old Nathan Gilmani and 18-year-old Troy Thomas were sentenced to life for murder. Despite the relative youth of the two defendants, I think the sentence reflects the chilling nature of what they've done and just the number of offences they committed in such a short space of time and their willingness to carry and use the knives that they were um, using to rob these people. The pair described as 21st century highway men committed a four-hour crime spree. Justice has been delivered, but violence of such nature is growing in England and Wales. This is the story of just one night.